So um, I want to welcome you to our first um, online edition of the Mars Congress, but our 10th anniversary uh, edition of the Mars Congress. And uh, um, my co-course director, Soren Rancic, is uh, going to tell you uh, something about the history of, of uh, the Mars Congress. And our co-course director, Benedikt Reutersberg, is also in the panel. And I'm really happy also to, to um, see all uh, the members of the Beautiful faculty. So, Soren, please uh, tell a little bit about uh, uh, the history of. Um... Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm privileged to welcome you with Professor Zimmerman to the new edition of the Mars course. I'm not aware, but I'm probably aware that you know what does it Mars means. Mars means management of aortic rupture Zurich. We did the first course on the 7th um, December 2010, and some of our faculty was also there. And we did it on the auspice of European Society of Vascular Surgery. It was a question those days why we have to organize one course on the rapture or one topic, why we have to organize that. And uh, there are several points why. Because the rapture AAA is fatal. And if we don't treat the patient, they're going to die. With time, there is a less patient in the rapture AAA because of screening and because of the people are currently less smoking. And uh, still there is debate what is better, how to treat the rapture AAA, by open surgery or by endovascular surgery. Some centers on one side have very good results in EVAR. And uh, it's what we think, it's not about the technique, but it's also about the, all the package. It's all about the management of aortic uh, ruptures. And uh, what we realized during these workshops and during these days that we don't have, that the many hospitals does not have standard operating procedure and defined pathway what to do in cases where there is some uh, rupture. So, that was our goal at the beginning. And also during all this period, I, our goal was to disseminate our knowledge, but also to learn from your questions and your commentaries. Over the 10 years, we had in total 40 faculties from different countries and have more than 180 participants. And I can say from all the continents, from Australia, India, United States, America, and from Mexico. These hand-ons, let's say hand-on uh, workshops where the uh, was based on the high interaction during the lectures during the work stations but also during the breaks so nowadays we are in a time of uh, online march we are going to come back when all this ghost time is going on so I will give the word again to Professor Zimmerman. And I must tell you, this is your course. This is what I'm saying always at the beginning. And um, you have to enjoy it and participate hard and ask us the questions. We are here to answer you and to please you. So welcome once again. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Soran. Um, again, also from my side, I would uh, like to welcome, first of all, our faculty and thank them for their willingness to participate in this event. And, Soren now has uh, told you a little bit about the history of the Mars Congress. And like many others, um, you already said that we were faced that uh, in this very special situation that uh, did not allow us to hold the Mars uh, uh, Congress in the usual way. So we decided due to the anniversary edition that uh, the Mars should take place. And um, I'm convinced that we were able to put together a really exciting and great program. And um, the response of uh, the registrations has overwhelmed us and, and confirmed uh, that we probably have made the right decision. So, um, of course, this is also without them, uh, these um, congresses and webinars won't work. I would also like to thank our sponsors. This is CryoLife Geotech, this is Medtronic, Jerumo Aortic, Provas, Cook Medical, and Abbott. And they made it possible for us to offer this anniversary edition free of charge. And at the last minute, we were also able to get the CME points for, for these four days. And since this event will take place over the four days, there is still the possibility for interested colleagues that they can register uh, for the remaining days. So please um, tell them and we are happy. Uh, the bigger the, the participants are, the, the, the bigger the crowd, the more um, answers and questions come, the better it will be. 
So please, please feel free to ask. And therefore, the chat for, uh, the chat um, is um, there. You can type in your question, and we will read it, and we will discuss about that. So now, after all the preparations, I'm really happy that um, March finally starts. And um, I will, uh, would like to welcome uh, the two chairmen, um, Clark Sebrecht from the Netherlands and Andrew Chong from Singapore. It's, it's a great honor to have you here. Thank you very much. And um, now I can finally um, announce the first speaker, and this is going to be um, Clark uh, with uh, the importance of forotic screening with a duplex ultrasound. Well, thank you, Alexander, Benedict, and Zoran uh, for the kind invitation uh, to take part of this uh, anniversary edition of this great aortic workshop. My disclosures. Well, the topic of screening is not new at all, as we are talking about screening for decades. And we all know the basic idea behind it, which includes an earlier diagnosis, early intervention, better treatment and faster recovery, and as a consequence, improved outcomes with reduced overall costs of care. Now, there have been four randomized trials of population-based screening for AAA in men in the UK, Denmark, and Australia, and one small trial in women. And all these trials used population registers, and randomization was either to an invitation for screening or no invitation. And overall, taken together in a Cochrane review, uh, there was a reduction in AAA specific mortality with an odds ratio of 0.60 in favor for screening of men. Also, at the longest reported follow up from each trial, all cause mortality was significantly lower in the groups invited to screening. On the basis of these conclusions, nationwide screening programs were implemented both in the UK and Sweden. Uh, in the UK, between 2009 and 2013, the prevalence of AAA was 1.3%, which was actually lower than, for instance, the mass study with 4.7%. And it even got further down to 1.0%, probably reflecting the changing epidemiology of aortic and other vascular diseases. Some 80, 870 men underwent a planned AAA intervention with 0.8% perioperative mortality. <clears throat> well, the Swedish screening program reached nationwide coverage in 2015. AAA prevalence appeared to be 1.5%, and after a mean of four and a half years, 29% had been operated on with a 30-day mortality rate of 0.9%. Clearly, a significant reduction in AAA-specific mortality was reached through screening, and the number needed to screen and the number needed to operate on to prevent one premature death were 667 and one and a half, and they predicted to annually prevent 90 premature deaths from AAA and to gain 577 quality-adjusted life years. What happened in the States? Uh, since 2005, the United States Preventive Service Task Force recommended a one-time ultrasound screening for men aged 65 to 75 years with a history of smoking, and it's still their main recommendation today. Um, in women, they advise against uh, screening. Two years ago, the SBS updated their own AAA guidelines recommending screening <clears throat> men and women aged 65 to 75 years with either a history of smoking or a family history of AAA, as well as men and women over the age of 75 with a smoking history and otherwise good health who have not previously undergone screening. So SVS also includes women and elderly, but unfortunately attendance rate in the US remains quite low. <clears throat> the SVS launched an even more recent uh, guideline in 2019, and they advise a one-time ultrasound screening in all European countries for men older than 65 years. Um, also, but the level of evidence is less for women 
uh, with a first degree relative for AAA and for those with a true peripheral arterial aneurysm. But opinions differ between countries and they have changed over the years, sometimes back and forth, also in our own country. Um, this may be the result of differences between countries in cost effectiveness and reimbursement. Well, if we look at our own country, there are several nationwide screening programs, but not after AAA. If there was one, it's estimated that yearly about 100,000 men would be invited and 90 deaths could be prevented at the cost of two perioperative deaths. In the Netherlands, treatment is regarded cost effective when one quality, so one year in good health, costs less than 20,000 euros. Incremental costs, so for screening but without treatment, in Sweden are 7,770 per quality, and for the Netherlands they are even lower. And if we include treatments, um, it's still estimated to be below 1,000 uh, euros per quality, indicating that a nationwide screening program would be cost effective. So this is already known for more than 20 years, but still the latest advice until today from the Ministry of Health is not to start a nationwide screening program. And some of the reasons uh, for this are listed here and include the idea it will not affect overall population mortality. Many will have overdiagnosis and overtreatment and suffer from complications of treatment. And then the committee says that even without such a program, Many triple A's are found in the Netherlands and mortality due to rupture has decreased uh, considerably any, anyway. So what should we do in the Netherlands? Targeted screening uh, in risk groups seems a good idea. And what we currently do in our own hospital is an additional screening for triple A in all patients with claudication or a peripheral aneurysm. Now, the topic uh, remains rather hot all over the world, and even last month, Vascular News headlined with a paper discussing the fact that current gu guidelines may be inadequate. They looked at more than 55,000 treated AAA patients in the US, and remarkably, the USPSTF guidelines would have identified fewer than one third of patients, while the expanded SVS guidelines would have captured 75%. Uh, so I guess the debate will continue also because still most of the patients with a AAA die not of a ruptured AAA. So a strict cardiovascular risk management will probably save more lives than dealing with AAA. So in summary, early AAA detection with screening program, programs is the most effective way of preventing AAA rupture and death, but situations between countries differ, mostly related to cost effectiveness and reimbursement issues. And this may be a reason to refrain from nationwide screening. And in such a case, targeted screening programs and the timely initiation of preventive measures could effectively reduce the AAA re related uh, mortality. I thank you for your attention. Okay, great. So now we open up for questions. So Clark, thank you very much um, from, from the audience. There's no question right now, but what I'm really interested in is because one thing is to do the screening, first of all, and to de de detect the people, but there is a publication, I don't know the author, and they, they found that more than one third of the ruptured patient had an already known aneurysm. And, and, and um, do you experience a difference between uh, screening protocols inside a hospital and uh, done by, I would say, vascular specialists and, uh, and a screening protocol done by general practitioners in, 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 in terms of that the right consequences are drawn out of the results. Because I think one thing is to detect the aneurysm and the other thing is really to, to draw the right, uh, the right consequence out of that. 
Well, <clears throat> thank you, Alex. But uh, well, as I told you, there is no national screening program in uh, the Netherlands. So every hospital, they do their own thing. And some hospitals, they just don't screen because the policy is not to screen because of the reasons I told you. And in our hospital years ago, we screened every patient that came to the vascular lab uh, for an investigation. And now uh, we just started half a year ago uh, by just uh, checking all the claudicans and the ones with peripheral aneurysms, and that's it. All general practitioners and others, they don't screen. So we are probably in our hospital, at least the only ones that screen. So, yeah. Yeah, well, because what I recognize sometimes is that uh, even uh, during a an, an routine ultrasound uh, of the uh, abdominal area, uh, general practitioners, they find uh, some kind of uh, aneurysm, but they don't draw the right consequences out of that. And I think this is something I, I recognize very often because we see patients with a rupture with six, six seven centimeter aneurysms and we ask them and they said, yeah, well, my physician told me I have something with my, with my order, but I was never sent to a vascular specialist. And I, this is the, the one point is I think to detect the problem and the other thing is to draw the right consequences of that. You're totally right. These are coincidental findings and once general petitioners uh, find them, they send them to us, sure. Yeah. They, they don't leave them alone, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, Clark, thank you very much. And um, if there are not more questions from, from the panelists or from the audience, I would uh, move on to the, to the next uh, talk. Uh, and uh, this is from uh, Andrew Chung. And he's going to, to talk about the forecasting aortic aneurysm rupture. It's, it was done a review of seasonal and atmospheric associations. So thank you very much. Good afternoon uh, or good evening, everybody. It's past midnight here in Singapore. My name is Andrew Chung. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at the National University Heart Center. And I'm very grateful to the organizers for the honor of inviting me to come and speak today. This is the current world we live in. And um, this virtual meeting is a way for us to still connect professionally and for that we're very grateful. My relevant disclosures um, and most importantly, I'd like to declare that I'm only a Game of Thrones fan from season one to season four. These are my handles and hashtags uh, for those of you who are active on social media. Um, and before I start my talk, I'd like to um, spay, pay special mention to uh, Professor Phil Walker, uh, consultant vascular surgeon at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital, as well as the Professor of Surgery at the University of Queensland. You'll know um, Prof Walker from his uh, seminal work with Michael Dake in Stanford, uh, when they've described the first thoracic stent graft and uh, his influence on this work um, uh, should not uh, go unmentioned. So this is Rubens engraving of Hippocrates and uh, he very clearly states, and I paraphrase, whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should proceed thus, in the first place to consider the seasons of the year and what effects each of them produces for they are not all alike than the winds the hot and the cold especially such as are common to all countries and then such as are peculiar to each locality as i talk to you today it's 29 degrees here in singapore and it's only five degrees in zurich and we are here to talk about forecasting aneurysm rupture this is the Malayan in Singapore, and you know we're a tropical country near to the equator. Uh, it's mostly hot and sunny and humid all year round, um, but we still get aneurysm. This work actually began in 2013 in Hobart when we first presented it as a poster at the ANZ SVS meeting. And back then we looked at 27 studies, looking at 46,580 patients, um, but 
there was no formal meta-analysis performed due to significant heterogeneity. However, several large studies suggested that there was a statistically significant seasonal increase uh, with aortic aneurysm rupture. We investigated this a little bit further and in 2014, uh, Rob Brightwell, myself and Phil Walker published this paper looking at a prospective database, looking at aneurysm rupture in southeastern Queensland where Rob and I were both fellows and we were pleased to report that this was the first study to demonstrate an association between temperature and the risk of abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture in the southern hemisphere. Moving on from there, we continued this work and we presented at the Munich Aortic and Crotter Conference in 2014 and we presented an update to the literature and the paper. And finally, this culminated in this paper in 2019 in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. And it's this particular paper that we would like to focus on today. And <clears throat> essentially what I'd like to say is that this paper is a labour of love. You know, we were really interested in it as a topic. We're not entirely sure uh, what direction, and we weren't sure what direction it would take, but we've seen it all the way through to the end. Um, and for that, we're very proud. Um, in particular, statistical methods have changed over time, and we are all very familiar with meta-analyses, but what you may not be as familiar with are meta-analyses of proportions. And essentially, what that is, is that it looks at uh, single uh, armed studies, yet we're allowed to uh, pool those together. So whilst most meta-analyses focus on effect size matrix, uh, meta-analyses of proportions can just be a single arm and it has a precise or gives a more precise estimate of the overall proportion for a certain case or a certain event. So back to the JBS paper from 2019 of ours, we looked at 31 retrospective studies, two cohort studies, and we looked at 51,000 patients from multiple regions. And you can see the regions here illustrated on the global map. We've got North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Asia's represented, and a lot of Central Europe is represented as well. And the things that we really looked at in particular was seasonality, atmospheric pressure, temperature, and daylight. Now, interestingly, atmospheric pressure, there was no real significant association, um, and there was no real association with atmospheric pressure either. Um, Takagi found that there was um, some association with reduced sunlight exposure, um, but other Japanese colleagues of his found that there was not any association. So conflicting results. However, from 33 studies with 50,000 patients, we did find that there was a statistically significant increased incidence of ruptured aneurysms in December. And this risk ratio in December was an absolute increased risk of 20% compared to other months. There was also a statistically significant increase of ruptures in winter and that risk ratio was an absolute increased risk of 19% when compared to the other seasons. So, autumn and winter months have been postulated as peak seasons. We're not sure why, but the effect of cold may be something, but we also acknowledge that temperature was not a risk factor alone. Uh, maybe it's respiratory tract infections, maybe it's environmental pollutants. It's hard to know with any degree of certainty. Whilst many studies failed to show any association uh, between atmospheric pressure and rupture, it has been suggested that reduction in atmospheric pressures, uh, which does happen in cold climate changes, may act across the aortic wall. Um, and therefore, any consideration that we give towards atmospheric pressure changes, maybe we should give a little bit more consideration to traveling at altitude or at depth. For example, uh, mountain climbing, uh, air travel, or even uh, deep sea diving. We acknowledge the limitations. There's broad heterogeneity. 
statistical association does not imply causation. There's the accuracy of the weather readings. And ultimately, it's quite hard to account for all the confounding factors. However, there really does appear to be an association with the incidence of aneurysm rupture, particularly in the winter months. How this relates to service provision remains to be seen. And again, more chronobiological research into abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture and dissection is definitely required. Um, and we would love to continue to collaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're now open again for the Q&A session. Well, thank you, Andrew. What a nice uh, presentation. Um, there are no uh, questions yet, um, but uh, I do have a question. Um, could it be that uh, because of Christmas days, people get, uh, um, have more emotions, they see their family, they go to church and it raises stress and this causes ruptures or is this too far? Parking Chair, it's an excellent question and we couldn't elucidate uh, exactly when in December uh, the rates of uh, rupture were higher. If most people's families or anything like my family's Christmas Day is an exceptionally stressful event, and I'm sure that does play a part in it. Um, so we, we, like I said, I think we acknowledge the limitations of the study, but as vascular surgeons, we all also know that there is such a thing as aneurysm season, and uh, we just try to apply a degree of science to this question to try and work out exactly what was going on. There is definitely something there. It's, it's like there is a mortality signal associated with uh, December, with winter months. Um, and, you know, for service provision or considerations of uh, stocks of stents or rotors, these things are worth considering. I'm not sure it's going to change our practice, particularly in terms of, you know, having two consultants on every day between sort of December and January. But it is something worth considering. Um, and I think it just lends a little bit of gravitas to what we already know, that there are definitely seasonal associations with rupture. We just can't quite work out why. Um, and I find it fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for, your, for the great presentation and also the great topic. I really enjoyed uh, that very much. And, and the interesting thing is that uh, the things you assume and the things you find in, 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 in scientific workup are very often different. And, and you, you said something or you wrote something about physiological um, thermal regulations. And I would, I would think that uh, firsthand that in the summer times when it's hot, that this is something that stresses the body and the blood pressure more, more and it would come to a rupture. And now you found it's vice versa that it's in, in the winter time that you have the higher numbers of, of, of ruptures. So you said you don't know why, but due to the physiological thermal regulations, do you know is what is there going on a little bit? Or is there something you could explain? I think it's a, a probably a, a broader question than that. If we assume uh, like the data suggests that there may be an association with atmospheric pressure, then it also, uh, the sequelae of that is trying to work out what we do when people say who have like a three centimeter aneurysm or a four centimeter aneurysm, do we have to caution them that perhaps they shouldn't go uh, travel on planes so often, or perhaps they shouldn't go diving so often, or perhaps they shouldn't go mountain climbing. It's those kind of activities that, you know, most of us don't really pay heed to. But if there is even a small association with just changes in weather, and we think it's changes as opposed to absolute, um, absolute pressures, then perhaps it is more about how we educate the patients that actually have aneurysms already and be wary and aware that the atmospheric pressure and their surrounding pressure or where they are in relation to sea level may actually make a difference um, to the progression of their aneurysm uh, and potential aneurysm rupture. 
Okay, so there, there's a good question uh, in the chat and um, that's the question, is it because it's diagnosed more during the winter months as the people of older age groups get admitted more to hospitals and therefore undergo more investigations and in the summer times probably you have more occult ruptures and you, uh, you, you, you don't uh, diagnose that. Yeah, so we couldn't work that out um, directly from the data that we had. We went with absolute numbers. So we went with diagnosis of ruptured aneurysms only. So it wasn't a diagnosis of an aneurysm per se. It wasn't uh, the finding of an aneurysm. It was presenting to hospital with a ruptured aneurysm. So it was a very particularly hard endpoint. So perhaps not because of that, but there is something about winter that clearly makes... Uh, uh, increase the propensity for people who have aneurysms to rupture. Um, and just very briefly to the next question, which says, what about countries where the whole year is practically summer? Well, we kind of accounted for that because we looked across all the countries. And so, as I showed you on the map, we had Central Europe, we had North America, we had Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. And Australia and New Zealand, slightly closer to the equator, they have less variation in their temperature. We still found that mortality signal in December in the winter months to be more prevalent. So it can't fully be explained by just uh, a temperature issue either. Okay, because this was one of the questions if with countries that has whole year or more mild uh, seasonal temperature, is there, is there a difference? So this is something uh, um, you answered. And, 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 and last questions probably, um, here, cold um, has an uh, impact on the uh, autonomic system, and therefore the increase of that may cause probably a rupture. So this is an assumption. Can you say something to that? I think, um, yes, that's, that's obviously possible. We know that the cold changes our peripheral resistance, uh, so there's increased circulating volume through the body. That, that, that's the physiology that we know of. Um, and maybe it's that, maybe, it, but what we found was it was really the change. So it's the change in pressures and the change from one particular season to another. Um, and so that is probably the bigger difference. Um, but I just note that one of our Mexican colleagues says that his rupture rates are higher in November and December as well, and they're in Mexico. So that kind of lends... Uh, uh, credence to our argument that December really is an issue um, but as to why it is we definitely need more research in it um, so yeah and I, I, I must admit I, I don't have a number of uh, patients that have ruptured or that I've known to have ruptured directly related to a significant change in pressure such as climbing mountains or diving before the event I, I don't have any personal experience of that Okay, so Andrew, thank you very much for this great presentation. We have to move on. And um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the next um, uh, presentation. It's from Moritz Wildgruber. He's a former colleague of mine. Now he's a co-director uh, of the Department of Radiology at the um, University Hospital in Munich, Germany. And um, he's going to talk about the CT scans in aortic ruptures. So thank you. Dear Alexander, dear colleagues, it is a pleasure for me uh, today to speak to you about computed tomography in patients with aortic emergencies. And this brings us directly to the question, what actually is an aortic emergency? We have to define this actually comes into play. So there's a variety of diseases that are affecting the so when to perform uh, the imaging in the course of clinical diagnosis? You all know that clinical symptoms may be mis misleading in aortic pat pathologies. And currently there's no specific biomarker from the laboratory indicating specific aortic pathologies. So there are a wide variety of algorithms that uh, look quite complicated when imaging should be integrated in suspicion of aortic diseases. And I would rather keep it simple and say rapid CT imaging in any case where aortic pathologies are in the differential diagnosis should be performed. And this also answers the question, what kind of imaging modality is uh, probably the imaging modality of choice? 
uh, it's computed tomography because it's fast, it's cheap, the sensitivity and specificity are the highest among other imaging modalities. TE or MRI also they provide more functional insights, they are laborious, time consuming and most of the time not available uh, at also, when looking at the current guidelines, the last being published by the European Society of Cardiology in 2014, um, here you see the different imaging modalities listed together with their advantages and disadvantages. And clearly the advantages of CTA in multiple studies outweigh the associated risk as well as the And when you take a closer look at the guidelines, you see that CTA also nicely enables to follows you most of the recommendations, not only how imaging should be performed, but also how it should be analyzed and how the images should be read. So for example, looking here at this first recommendation uh, that tells us that the diameters should be measured at pre-specified anatomical landmarks perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. This can be nicely performed on multiplanar reconstructions that are regularly obtained in CT. Technical requirements, that's very simple. Uh, any uh, multi-slice detector CT with over 64 rows is uh, eligible. Um, bolus triggering is performed uh, to get a nice contrast within the uh, aorta. Um, take care that if you're especially using fast dual source CT scanners that the scanner may actually outpace the intravascular contrast bolus, especially when you have large abdominal aortic aneurysms, so adjust the protocols uh, to your skin. Non-cast contrast and enhanced CT should definitely be added, to, especially in suspicion of intramural hematoma. You can see the hyperdense rim within the aortic wall. CTA in arterial phase, I think that's self-explanatory. You can see that the section membrane differentiated true and false lumen. And additionally, a venous phase should be added. It helps you to uh, diagnose and judge partial thrombosis within the false lumen, and especially to assess organ perfusion of the kidneys and so what the surgeon wants to know, localization that's clear, is it a Stanford A or type B dissection or in rare cases a non-type A, non-type B dissection? Is it a covered versus free rupture, which compartments are affected? To which extent is the dissection going coronary arteries, mesentery, renal, etc.? What's uh, the organ perfusion? Uh, I said the kidneys and the gut are specifically Important. And in case of intramural hematoma, thickening of the wall and hyperdense rim or nave CT. Not to forget. Some examples here on the CTA, you can nicely see the dissection membrane and the ascending and descending aorta corresponding with the pathology. In this case, you can nicely visualize the entry of. Um, the extension into the supraortic vessels, uh, the mesenterics, the iliac arteries, uh, which is important for therapy. Intramural hematoma, this is rather a rare disease. Here you can appreciate the hyperdense rim of the acute hematoma within the thickened uh, vascular wall. Mnemonic is that you see the calcifications shifted um, towards the lumen with the hematoma here in the wall and this irregular thickening of the aortic wall which is important in the differential compared to vasculitis. Here again a video series of intramural hematoma um, showing the irregular wall thickening and the extension of the aorta atherosclerotic plaques um, towards the lumen. As a rare complication here, an intramural hematoma um, affecting also um, the uh, ascending aorta. Here you can see a, a clear compression of the coronary artery uh, together with a pericardium in this case. Penetrating aortic ulcers are important because they are frequently considered as the kind of origin uh, of subsequent pathologies such as 
um, intramural hematoma or dissection, so defined as a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, which leads to an erosion of the intima, including the internet elastic lamina and bulging of the adventitia. Here you can see the contrast extravasate within the aortic wall in the CTA, nicely depicting this. And again, here the potential uh, pathogenic cascade of those diseases, um, as many people now consider it, it may all start with the ulcerated plaque leading to an ulcer uh, um, aortic ulcer, intramural hematoma may, may be the consequence of this. And if there is a luminal entry into the aortic wall, then we have the aortic dissection. And these pathologies can be nicely tracked by serial imaging, uh, such as CT and CT imaging is also to able to um, assess most of the complications associated with these major aortic pathologies, dissection, intramural hematoma, and penetrating aortic ulcer. Myocardial ischemia in 10 to 15 percent, aortic valve insufficiency, pericardial tamponade, mesenteric infarction, and renal failure or renal infarction are rather rare. But nevertheless, you get all this information with a one stop. So, this already brings me to the summary. CT imaging is the modality, imaging modality of choice in aortic emergency. In the primary diagnosis, keep in mind that CT and geography should not be limited to an arterial phase. You should always perform three phases, a non-contrast enhanced CT, then an arterial phase and a venous phase. Non-contrast enhanced CT specifically to visualize the intramural hematoma and the venous phase to especially assess associated complications arising from aortic pathologies. R imaging should be performed rapidly within the diagnostic workup, especially um, in if the clinician judges this, these diseases as hyperacute emergencies that need immediate treatment. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. And now we open up for Q&A. Well, thank you, Moritz, for a very, very nice uh, presentation. Um, do you see any role for ECG-gated uh, uh, CT scanning? Um, if you have the possibilities uh, available, then I would definitely vote for it. But from everyday care, I would say that um, ECG triggering, especially in the emergency uh, setting, is not performed because it's too time consuming. And I, I would also honestly commit that also at our hospital, if the ambulance car arrives at 2, uh, 2 a.m. in the morning, um, ECG triggering is not readily, readily available. So yes, it makes the diagnosis more precise and sometimes uh, the, the blood flow can cause disturbances and um, impair a little bit the image interpretation. But uh, I think this is not standard of care yet. And I guess it's also hard to implement in a 24 hour service. Well, we, we have the luck, uh, Moritz, to, to have one, uh, even also in the emergency uh, situation. Uh, okay. It takes about, well, let's say one and a half, two minutes uh, extra. Uh, <clears throat> and in cases of dissection or intramural hematoma, it's really worthwhile, I think. Definitely, definitely. I would definitely say it's worthwhile. I think it's pre, pre, uh, predominantly a matter of training of the staff. Yeah. If, if you're well trained, then, then I agree that it's only a matter of a few minutes that are definitely worth to invest. Ag agree. So Moritz, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, um, I, I ask uh, the question because you very often see it uh, that uh, 
when you when you come in an emergency to the emergency room, first everyone asks for 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 a fast uh, ultrasound. Do you see any role for ultrasound still in these cases where we have a very high suspicion of of a ruptured aortic aneurysm? Actually, not. I would say the specificity and sensitivity is limited of this um, of this technique, and I would. Uh, I would fear especially that um, it it delays the process of actual diagnosis. So uh, also when we're getting away from aortic pathologies, fast ultrasound is more and more skipped from the emergency setting and uh, imaging, especially in cases also of unknown pathologies, um, going rapidly to the CT is, is clearly, I think, the decision of choice. If you have the fast ultrasound available and you don't delay the rest of the diagnosis, uh, diagnostic process, fine. But uh, I would not uh, implement it and, and, and waste time uh, to proceed to CT. Okay. I agree completely with you. There's another question. So do you see any indication for CT without uh, uh, contrast? No, <laughs> no, that's, that, that's first on the hand, it's stupid in, in the diagnostic process and the fear of contrast induced nephropathy. To, to make this clear, there are no data that really prove that after venous administration of contrast agent, there's a significant deterioration of kidney function. The data that uh, show that contrast agent is bad for the kidneys is all derived from intra-arterial application, especially from the field of cardiology, where you sometimes inject four to 500 milliliters. So there is no real proof that intravenous contrast ad administration really deteriorates your kidney function. So in case of emergency, please never without contrast. Okay. Yeah, so uh, great. So uh, last question, probably how much contrast do you do you um, inject in your protocol? In these emergency protocols with unknown pathologies, and if you have people with regular size, we give 120 milliliters um, as a standard dose. This can definitely be reduced, but the more you reduce it, the more, uh, the more you risk impaired image quality. And this I would not do in the emergency setting. So if you have elective procedures, fine, you can, and the patient is very small, you can scale it down. But for the emergency setting, I would keep with a relatively high dose so that you don't have to repeat your exam. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, much Moritz, for, 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 your, for your great talk. And there are some questions about indication for CT scan after the procedure. So this is a topic we are going to hear uh, in another talk in this session. And there's also a question about sizing and, uh, and uh, the right blood pressure for the CT scan. This is something we are going to hear in the next presentation. From, so from Benedikt Reutersberg, uh, he's um, the co-director of this course, and he's also the co-director of uh, the Department of Vascular Surgery here in Zurich. So now I'm, I'm really happy to hear, hear this uh, talk from Benedikt. Thank you. Sizing and planning of endovascular treatment in ruptured aortic aneurysms. These are my conflicts of interest. First and foremost, meaningful imaging is needed when planning endovascular procedures. There has been much discussion as to whether there is time for CTA even in the event of a rupture. Lloyd and colleagues could already show in 2004 on the basis of a cohort of ruptured triple A's who were treated palliatively that more than 80% of the patients lived for at least two hours after admission. They conclude that we have the time and patients can therefore safely undergo CT. Imaging is essential because we first need to confirm our suspected diagnosis of a ruptured AAA. Second, we need to be certain whether implantation of an EVAR is anatomically feasible. We need to determine the proximal extension of the aneurysm, which is not adequately possible by sonography. Additionally, we have to determine the landing zones and furthermore, among other things, the access routes and the diameter must be assured as well. After imaging comes the measurements, which ideally take place on a dedicated 3D workstation 
with the possibility of post-processing. Their advantage is that they are time-saving as well as more accurate with less intra- and inter-observer variability. On the other hand, they are expensive, therefore not widely used, and since they are not always integrated into packs, in some cases they also involve a loss of time if you still have to burn a CD-ROM. Therefore, one should always be familiar and confident with the classic 2D measurement method as well. Depending on the anatomical extent of the ruptured AAA, different endovascular options can be planned. From standard EVA, from a mono or bialyac, to parallel grafts of the shelf branched physician modified EVARs. A standard EVA is feasible if the following anatomical conditions are present. First, the proximal landing zone has a diameter less than or equal to 32 mm, a cylindrical neck greater than 10 mm, ideally greater than 50 mm. Second, the distal landing zone has a healthy cylindrical length of at least 10 mm and a diameter of less than 22 mm in the iliac, as well as a sufficient femoral and iliac excess vessels with a diameter depending on the device manufacturer of at least 6 mm. A standardized measurement plan is useful for documentation and should also be used in the context of planning elective AAA cases and with which experience should be gained. The first example shows an elective case based on the CT. An anatomy sketch is created in which the diameters of the proximal and distal landing zones as well as the corresponding length measurements are entered. In addition, the angles important for the subsequent C-arm angulation, such as the craniocaudal proximal neck angle for parallaxial compensation are noted. Based on the measurement results, suitable prostheses are selected from those available in stock and also noted in the measurement plan. In addition, special features can be noted, such as from which side the main body should be implanted, whether a percutaneous access is possible, or whether there is any other anatomical speciality. The second example shows that such detailed measurement plans are also possible in the case of ruptures. If there is only little time available, the measurement plan can also be somewhat faster, as in the third example in which only the diameters of the proximal neck and the iliac vessels were measured. The length measurements can then be made intraoperatively using a graded measurement cathedral. If a sufficient proximal landing zone is not available, alternatives such as parallel graft EVA, branched or physician modified EVA must be planned. In the case of a ruptured juxtarenal AAA in which the bailout procedure of a parallel graft EVA is planned, the following measurements must be made in addition to a standard EVA. First, the aortic diameter at the level of the renals, which is uh, the new landing zone, and second, the diameter of the renal arteries themselves. In our department, we never plan more than two parallel grafts, otherwise it does not seal in our experience. To calculate the oversizing, we then use the following formula of the sum of the mean value of both parallel graph diameters and the aortic diameter. More on this will be certainly be presented to you by Professor Donas at March Day 3. If the extent of the aneurysm is more proximal, of the shelf branched evas of physician modified stand grafts must be planned. If the diameter is over 30 mm in the area of the reno visceral segment, a branched EVA is planned. Otherwise, we plan a physician modified device. As off the shelf devices, we currently use the Cook T branch outer branch and the Yotec end side inner branch prosthesis. With the latter, the diameter in the reno visceral segment can also be at only 24 mm. For planning, each prosthesis manufacturer provides its own measuring templates for the procedure and selection of the appropriate components, in particular the orientation of the renovistal arteries must be recorded. This allows anatomical feasibility in almost 50% of the respective cases. If this is not anatomically possible or if the combination of fenestration and branches is necessary, there is always the possibility of planning physician-modified devices. 
more about this at March Day 3 by Professor Zinim Paris and a special lecture. In summary, imaging is essential. Standardization and training of measurements and planning should be practiced and perfected in elective cases. Availability of appropriate equipment in stock is needed. These must be known so that a suitable solution can be found for each individual morphology. In the case of morphologically unsuitable or extremely unstable patients, one still has the option for open surgery, whereby these skills must not be lost here. Thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Benedict. Now we're over to the Q&A. I think there was already a question um, in the um, question answer, answer section um, concerning uh, how to plan um, uh, in patients which are quite uh, hypovolame. And um, I think um, Zoran, maybe um, you just uh, did a study about that. Maybe you can answer that. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, Zoran, you have to um, unmute. Oh, again, Zoran, you're still on mute. Zoran, you're still on mute, so just click it once. Okay. Yes. Sorry, now I'm not on mute anymore. The, we did a study where we took uh, the patient with ratchet AAA in the blood pressure systolic below the 100 and the, make it, uh, to make a conclusion, we realized that the, the biggest difference is in the diameter of external iliac artery and the common iliac artery. So in the patient with blood pressure systolic below 100 millimeters mercury, we have decrease in the diameter of uh, 13 to 16%. 13% is iliac common is artery and 16% iliac externa. That means when we are planning the procedure, we have to realize to oversize additional in patients with uh, external, um, with the diameter of, um, in this patient with the lower blood pressure. Uh, of course, we could not include the situation when there is a calcification because it's di very difficult to analyze, but in patients with the lower blood pressure, this is the difference of 13 to 16%. Okay. Thank you, Soran. There's another question for you, Benedict. And do you use uh, T branches in acute cases? Actually, we do. Um, we did a couple of those. Um, um, the good thing is that uh, in the first uh, um, steps, uh, you just uh, implant uh, the main body and um, uh, just uh, complete it uh, distally. Um, and uh, afterwards, uh, you can um, block um, partly the T branch or, or uh, usually the uh, area where the rupture is already sealed, and you have a, uh, your patients get uh, much quicker stabilized, and uh, then you have time to just uh, cannulate um, all the target vessels uh, from from the top. So um, it, it works very well. Okay, another, another interesting question from Tarek Pai. He's asking how much time is usually involved in uh, taking measurements and planning um, the EVA cases because we have to consider that these are ruptured aneurysms and uh, therefore we should be in a little bit in a hurry. So um, as I tried to demonstrate in one of the, um, the measurements, um, where I showed the um, anatomical sketch, uh, usually uh, it can be performed quite fast. Um, uh, so uh, usually you have um, a two person, uh, so it's uh, our protocol, we have one consultant vascular surgeon and one, uh, um, um, one fellow in training who, who are on call and uh, doing those cases. And uh, the, the fellow is taking care of the patient and the consultant who's the one with experience uh, does the measurements uh, and uh, as we also perform a lot of elective cases and do um, a train are there for well trained um, uh, we um, do this measurements quite quickly and um, 
you only need the diameters in the first place to choose the right uh, stand graft and um, especially for the main body and um, the length of the bodies you can use uh, by, by putting a graduated pigtail catheter into the patients. Uh, this is um, what you can do if you have no time. But um, as I tried to, to um, uh, show in my first slide, you have time. Um, um, usually you have time for the CT can and you have time for, uh, the, um, for, for the measurements as well. Oh, sorry, Alexander, you're on mute. Two short questions concerning the performance. One, how many ruptures do you treat in uh, Zurich per year? Do you know that? Um, we, uh, at the moment, it's winter uh, uh, coming, um, uh, referencing to Andrew's talk. Uh, we have, at the moment, one to two ruptures a week, uh, which... Um, it's very interesting in summer times. Uh, actually, we didn't saw this uh, dip uh, where there was the same. Next question. Uh, you're Alex, you're, Alex, you're and do, you, do, you, do you work together with interventional radiology? Uh, we do. Uh, we perform our um, cases um, in, in an interdisciplinary approach and uh, um, uh, we, we plan and uh, see the patients together. Again, so thank you, Benedict. We, we have to move on to the, to the next uh, presentation. Uh, this is going to be Lawrence Moyley. He's also from the Department of Vascular Surgery here in Zurich, and he's going to talk about predictive models. Good evening, my name is Lawrence Smoley. I'm a trainee in vascular surgery at Professor Zimmermann's clinic and a medical statistician. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak about predictive models for mortality after rapture aortic aneurysms. I have no conflict of interest. A good predictive model is characterized by an optimal fit on both the available data new subject outside the original data. To achieve good discrimination ability, a predictive model should be based on a pre-selection of variables in a systematic literature review. Variables should then be selected using advanced statistical methods. Next, the model should be tested and validated on the original data. In further steps, the model should also be validated on new individuals. This is called external validation. The main goal of the variable selection process and the model validation process is to get a reliable model that is precise and robust when it is used on new patients. If the model is too close to the original data it will only be precise for this particular patient cohort, a situation called overfit. The solution is to use advanced statistical methods that help to identify the most relevant variables. These methods also include internal model validation, that means testing of the model on the original data. There are at least six models out there and available for the prediction of mortality after ruptured aortic aneurysms. As you can see, the first five models were built in the era prior to the broad use of EVA in ruptured aortic aneurysms. At least the first three can be called historic, since they included patients that were treated roughly three decades ago. This is an overview on these six models. The number of patients and events that were included to build these models was rather small. Only the most two recently published models included a decent number of patients and only the rapid ruptured AAA score included patients that were treated with EVAR. Of note, none of the models 
used machine learning for variable selection. Further, in sample validation was only conducted by one study group. The frequently identified predictors include higher age, impaired consciousness, hemodynamic instability, and impaired kidney function. Model performance is typically identified using the area under the curve. In short, this is a combined measure for sensitivity and specificity where 0.5 means that 50% of the patients are predicted correctly or this is a coin flipping situation so the model is worthless or on the other extreme it's 1.0 that indicates perfect discrimination ability where every patient's outcome is predicted correctly. Discrimination ability was only published for the vascular study group of New England score and the rapid ruptured aortic aneurysm score, an update of the former. On their original data, the discrimination ability was satisfactory for the rapid ruptured aortic aneurysm score and good for the vascular study group of New England score. Most of the predictive models have been externally validated and updated using bigger and more contemporary datasets. An overview on these studies and estimated prediction performance can be seen on the next slide. Right Becks and Nielsen externally validated most of the available models at the time of their publications. Discrimination ability of the predictive models was reported using the area under the curve. The Glasgow aneurysm score and the Vancouver score showed good discrimination ability on the study population of Becks whereas none of the models performed good on the study population of Reiter and also on the study population of Nielsen. In summary, there are several models available, but from a statistical point of view, heavy limitations persist. None of the models persistently showed good discrimination ability in external validation. Still, higher age, impaired consciousness, shock, and elevated creatinine at the time of presentation with ruptured aortic aneurysm predict an impaired outcome. Further, the necessity for open repair was associated with increased mortality in several studies. But the most important, none of the models reliably identifies patient patient with no reasonable chance of survival. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. And we now have Lorenz with us, um, ready for Q&A. Over to you. Good evening. So, um... Yeah, you already you already said that, and there are also two commenters in, in, in the in the chat sections. One is the ESVS guidelines indeed advise not to use these models to decide if somebody should be treated or not. This is also said in your conclusion. So, but uh, tomorrow we are going to hear something about uh, eth ethical considerations in terms of treatment of ruptured aneurysms. So, um, probably I won't say that this could um, be responsible for, for withholding a therapy, but probably it could have an influence on, on um, the information you will give for the patient, even it's, it's an emergency situation. So do you see any, any terms of clinical consequences in uh, talking to the patient about, about his prognosis? In the... In the emergency setting, in the setting of a ruptured aortic aneurysm, I'm not really sure if 
if a predictive model is very helpful, to be honest. I think the the position or the place for these models, it's more in the in the elective setting when it goes to talking about um, diameter thresholds. It's of course not the same if you have a very old, very frail patient with a five centimeter or 5.5 centimeter diameter aneurysm compared to a very young, very healthy patient um, besides his aneurysm. So I believe the predictive models are more in are more helpful in these situations. And when it comes to a patient that has actually a rupture, it's I I think it's the question is simpler. It's more about do, do you want that we try? Even even if we know you maybe will not survive it, or or do you now want the best supportive care and um, don't suffer from pain? So it's it's easier in in one way. But but to be honest, I think uh, the, the prediction should not o o only be about uh, survival or not. It should also be about uh, in terms of uh, quality of life. And I think for for a very old patient, uh, for example, uh, the loss uh, the loss of renal uh, function, the renal insufficiency, and the dialysis after that would make a ma major impact of quality of life. And therefore, if they have these informations and you have a predictive model for that, probably the decision making of the patient would be different. I agree. The the models um, published here they they only um, looked at overall mortality or thirty day mortality, and uh, but I totally agree if um, if we could figure out and identify patients which we presume that they will have an impaired um, quality of life, this would uh, would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's the last question. Can Euroscore 2 from cardiac surgery give more of a grip on risk assessment for acute erotic syndromes? Is this in the... In the chat section, yeah. Yeah. So in, I, I only saw models for, for um, predictive uh, prediction of uh, ruptured infrarenal aortic aneurysms and not for other conditions here. Okay. I believe the data the data sets that are available are far too small um, for these other indications. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, very much. We have to we have to move on. We are a little bit late already. There are no more questions. And um, is. Um, I would go on to Wilma Schierling. Uh, she's, she's consultant at the University Hospital in Regensburg, and she's going to talk about the post-operative imaging follow-up protocols. Thank you. Dear chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, good evening from the University Hospital Regensburg for a lecture on the follow-up care after the treatment of aortic aneurysms. My conflicts of interest. What are possible late complications after the treatment of aortic aneurysms? After open surgery, these include paraanastomotic aneurysm formation, limb occlusion, incisional hernia, graft infection, and aortoenteric fistula. On this slide, you can see an example of a typical proximal paraanastomotic aneurysm that was treated using a branched endograft. Therefore, after open repair, imaging of the entire aorta and peripheral arteries is recommended every five years to detect possible late complications and secondary aneurysm formation. Late complications after EVA are migration, limb occlusion, infection, and all endolic associated complications leading to suck enlargement and late rupture. CTA can in principle detect all possible EVA complications, but has the potential risk of radiation and renal failure. Abdominal X-ray examination is particularly suitable for the detection of migration and component overlap failure. The detection of a limb occlusion is usually simple. 
Much more difficult is the detection of thrombi in the stent graft, which can lead to peripheral embolization. A PET CT examination is the preferred method for suspected stent graft infection, such as found in patients with an aortoenteric fistula. The best result can therefore be achieved with a combination of all imaging modalities. A central role is played by the correct determination of the aortic diameter. In Germany, it is recommended to determine the aortic diameter from the outer wall reflection to the inner wall reflection, perpendicular to the aortic axis by the so-called leading edge method. Hints of an existing endoleak can be aneurysm sac pulsation, liquid areas in the aneurysm sac, and the detection of an endoleak in the color-coded duplex mode. The highest sensitivity for the detection of an endoleak can be achieved with contrast-enhanced sonography, which should be performed over at least two minutes to show also late endoleaks. This is an example of a combined type 2 endoleak via lumbar arteries and the inferior mesenteric artery. It is therefore advisable to obtain baseline findings within the first 30 days using all imaging modalities. If a regular aneurysm exclusion without endoleak is found, the next follow-up by ultrasound is in one year. If a type 2 endoleak is found, it should be checked every six months at least initially. If the aneurysm diameter shrinks and there is no stent migration on the X-ray, Next, routine CTA is recommended at five years. If aneurysm grows or cures, the cause must be identified in every case. All imaging modalities should be used for this purpose. Only slightly different recommendations can also be found in the guidelines of the Society for Vascular Surgery which also recommends baseline imaging in the first month after EBAR. In the absence of an endoleak or suck enlargement, imaging should be repeated in 12 months and then annually thereafter. If a type 2 endoleak is associated with an aneurysm deck that is shrinking or stable in size, color duplex is suggested at 6 month intervals for 24 months and then again annually thereafter. Routine non-contrast CT imaging of the entire aorta is recommended at 5-year intervals after open repair or EVAR. The German Society for Vascular Surgery also recommends postoperative surveillance depending on aneurysm size and the presence of a type 2 endoleak. In summary, a standardized follow-up protocol is very important to detect and treat possible late complications after aortic aneurysm repair. This applies to elective aneurysm surgery as well as to emergency repair. All imaging modalities should be combined and used in a meaningful way. Non-contrast enhanced CT is an alternative for patients with renal insufficiency. MRA is an option, especially after open repair and for patients with MR-suitable stand grafts. A routine annual CT scan is not recommended. Thank you for your attention. With greetings from our entire team, I now look forward to your questions. Thank you, Wilma. Um, over to you for Q and A. So yes, thank you for for for, for your talk. And um, 
I, I completely agree with you that I think a duplex ultrasound is probably the main investigational method uh, for a follow up. But um, so also in the guidelines, um, you, you showed us, uh, they always uh, talk about or they write about uh, aneurysms with an increased diameter. So now there are data that show that not only the, the, the increasing diameter, but also the stable diameter after EVA treatment is associated with a worse outcome in, in contrast to a decreasing diameter. So do you, do you really have only the narrow follow-up intervals for this increasing diameter or also for the stable sex? Yeah, good evening, everyone. And first of all, thank you for the invitation to this uh, great Congress. Um, to your question, it depends a bit on the aneurysm size. If you have aneurysm that were treated with a diameter of about seven or even eight centimeters, then uh, we have closer follow up uh, intervals than if you have aneurysm that have just four centimeters in size. Okay, and uh, the, the, the guidelines you presented, um, they are, I think they are for, for elective settings, for electric, elective EVRs or elective open repair. Do you make any difference for elective and, and emergent cases? Well, I think um, we just make a difference uh, during the first hospital stay. If we have patients with a ruptured aneurysm, you have to be sure that there is no problem and no annually before the patients leave the hospital. So they all have uh, to have a CT scan before they leave. Uh, but afterwards, um, if, if everything is fine and there is no annual leak and no increasing aneurysm size, they are just in the same follow-up protocol as the elective cases. Okay, okay. Another question here is uh, with uh, contrast-enhanced ultrasound because you have a little bit more, um, you see a, bit more, a little bit more about the hemodynamics there. So um, even if uh, you see after an EVA implantation, you see with your contrast-enhanced ultrasound a type 2 annually, is there, are there any special findings that would, um, that would um, um, lead you to an open treatment, even there is no grow in size? Um, like no, a very yeah. big annual leak or with a very fast, with a very fast. Uh, um, yeah, there were no specific data um, about this, yeah, hemodynamics of the annual leak. So, in our clinic, if we see a type 2 endoleak, we make a closer follow-up in the beginning. Um, and then we, we just look if there are growth of the aneurysm sac. If there are growth, of course, uh, patients have to be treated. But first, interventionally, if possible, with onyx embolization or coiling of the uh, RME and so on. And um, the open repair is, is just the last um, of the therapeutic options we use because often patients are the old and so ill that you can't offer them the, the open operation. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for, for, for this great presentation. Now we would come to the special lecture. It's about um, how to do it, how to make uh, physician modified stand grafts. And uh, this is going to take a little bit longer. It's about uh, 30 minutes of special talk. And afterwards uh, we are here for, for your questions. Thank you. Welcome to the first special lecture of the MART webinar. It's um, about how to do physician modified endovascular stand grafts. My name is Alexander Zimmermann from the Department of Vascular Surgery at the University Hospital Zurich. These are my disclosures. So um, here's a short overview about the topics I'm going to talk about. First of all, uh, it's about legal and regulatory issues, and I think that's most uh, important point, the proper patient selection and planning, the preparation of the physician modified endograft with all these uh, different topics and the implantation process and last but not least closing remarks. Most of the uh, drawings and the figures that are used within this uh, talk are out of the book Endovascular Aortic Repair from Gustavo Woodridge. 
Um, I really can recommend this book. It's 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 a really really good book dealing with all aspects of endovascular treatment of all the pathologies and uh, I learned a lot about uh, with uh, reading this book. So first of all, um, I said we have to talk about legal and regulatory issues and this is because uh, the physician modified endograft treatment is on the one hand an off-label use of a stand graft that uh, was intended to put in the patient as whole and not to be modified by the physician and it is a significant risk device and why is it a significant risk device on the one hand because you do modifications that probably don't fit into the patient's anatomy on the one hand and on the other hand is that the modifications you do probably don't stand the test of time and therefore other issues uh, will arise out of that. And uh, what you can do is, uh, or what you have to do is that uh, an approval from your institutional review board and investigational device exemptions are required. And therefore you really have to check and you should check your national legal situation because otherwise, if something uh, goes wrong, you will get in uh, legal troubles and uh, this is nothing a physician should get into. And what you can do is that you um, conduct that as an investig investigational um, device exemption clinical trial. And, and um, probably this is something that uh, can solve this uh, legal and regulatory issue. So when we come to patient selection and planning, we're talking about on the one hand of abdominal aortic aneurysms and on the other hand of thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms. For the treatment of thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms nowadays, we have uh, two really good um, endovascular off-the-shelf multi-branch devices. On the one hand, the T-branch from Cook, and on the other hand, the newer one, the N-side prosthesis from CryoLife JokeTech. And um, this is something uh, that if you have them off the shelf, you don't have any time delay. You can you can treat uh, you can treat the patient immediately without any time loss, and uh, this is something that is really important in terms of aortic ruptures. On the other hand, if you have an infrarenal aortic aneurysm with a proper proximal neck and landing zone. Uh, you don't have to, to um, modify your stand graft. If the uh, excess vessels are fine, you can put, put in just a standard EVA and uh, you also won't have a problem. So most of the cases we are talking about that have or that can be treated with a modified uh, stand graft is on the one hand, juxtarenal, pararenal or suprarenal aortic aneurysms. On the other hand, these um, patients that don't fit into the off um, the shelf um, device um, I have used. For the planning, you can use on the one hand dedicated uh, planning software, so like Endocyte through Mensure, Autofit, or Cyrix. So, in some terms, it makes it easier for you because it's an automatic uh, process that gives you the different distances and orientations of uh, your target vessels but on the other hand not everyone has this dedicated software so you also can use your DICOM viewer and with your DICOM viewer you just has you should be sure that you can do multiplanar reconstructions and then you should um, measure uh, the distance between all of your renal visceral vessels you should measure the distance between uh, the intended uh, proximal um, landing zone and the beginning of your renal visceral vessels and you should um, measure uh, also um, the orientation of um, the origin of your target vessels. And here you see the problem with um, automated uh, planning software. So, because most often what they do is that they make a center line a measurement. And on the other hand, um, you have to keep in mind that if you put in the, your delivery system of your stand graph, probably the stand graft and the delivery system will take a completely other way um, than uh, the center line. And here, just uh, this is especially true for very kinked or neurotic necks. And here you can see one of, uh, of, of these uh, problems. So, and what this will result in is, for example, that the distance between the renal arteries are totally different if you measure them perpendicular to the aortic axis 
or if you measure them perpendicular to the intended way of the delivery system and of the um, placement of the stand graft and the deployment of the stand graft. And this is also true for the fenestrations because um, it makes it a lot of easy, easier if you have a kind of diameter reducing technique like a diameter reducing wire or diameter reducing suture. This is something that we will can come later on to. And you really have to plan where you put your fenestrations in terms of anatomy and on the other hand, in terms of how will your stand graft react. So I think this is something that uh, plays only a minor role in, in, in the planning of this physician modified stand crafts. And what I do is that I m make a measurement of the clock positions of, of the renal visceral vessels. And here you can see, for example, the, scene, the celiac trunk is at one o'clock, the SMA is at 12 o'clock, the right renal artery is at, um, is at 10 o'clock and the left renal artery is at, at, at four o'clock. And when you have to put these um, clock positions onto your stand craft, you just have to, to check what is the diameter of the stand craft you intend to put in. And then you just have to calculate the circumference of the stand craft. And in this case, it was a 24 millimeter stand craft and the circumference therefore is um, 75.4 millimeters. And then if you divide that with 12, you will come to the distance on the circumference of one hour. And if you divide it therefore again with four, you will come to the distance in the, on the circumference of a quarter hour. And this is important when you do your drawings on your stand craft and your modifications on your stand craft. So if you have a center line, then uh, at 12 o'clock. So you don't have to make any adjustments for the SMA because it's in the middle line, but the celiac trunk is with one o'clock more to the left and you have just to go 6.3 millimeters to the left on the stand craft. And um, for the right and left renal artery, artery it's um, uh, the same. You just have to put the differences in the clock position to millimeters and then you can you have you can do the adjustment the stand craft. you will see that later on a video so this is um, a, a, a patient uh, I'm going to show you what we that we've treated with a physician modified stand graft this was a, a symptomatic um, paranarenal aortic aneurysms and what we did was a, a two-fold modified stand graft with two fenestrations for both renal arteries and a scallop for the um, for the SMA. And we did all the measurements. I told you we, we measured between the renal visceral vessels. We made the measurements of the diameter. And here you can see for the uh, left renal artery, the right renal artery um, we had a diameter of five millimeters. Um, the diameter of the intended um, proximal landing zone was about 20. Uh, here within the renal vessels, this was about 22. So this was the reason why we decided for a 24 millimeter stand graft. The distance from the uh, SMA to the um, to the left renal artery, artery was um, um, 37 millimeters. Um, between the SMA and the right renal artery it was three millimeters between um, there and uh, therefore if you um, add um, the diameter uh, you you will get to 22 millimeters between the right and the left renal artery and you really have to be consistent where you measure do you measure from from the bottom of the, the, the first vessel to the top of the second vessel? Do you measure from the center of the vessel to the other center of the vessel? So you really have to keep in mind what you measure. And uh, because this is something when you put on the stand graph, the distances, this really can make a difference in terms of three to four millimeters and can um, make a, or will have a big influence 
about succeeding in cannulating the uh, intended target vessel or not. This is a sketch uh, for, for this patient. We put any kind of, of measurements on. We put the distances on. We put the diameters on. We put the clock positions at the bottom. You can see the different clock positions um, with uh, 9.30 of the right renal artery, 1 o'clock for, for the for, uh, SMA and uh, 4 uh, o'clock for the left renal artery. And um, then we come now already to the preparation of the physician modified stand graph. So first of all, this is something I told you before uh, when it comes to the patient's uh, selection. Whenever use of the shelf stand grafts, because time matters. For infrarenal and you have a proper landing zone, you can use just standard EVAs. For, for um, toracoabdominal aneurysms, you can use this off-the-shelf multi-branch devices. And even now with the Ensite um, prosthesis from Cryolife Yotec, this is something that goes down to 24 millimeters in the renal visceral segment. So therefore, it's um, also um, feasible to use in ruptured uh, pararenal or juxtarenal aortic aneurysms, even if you have to go a little bit higher and sacrifice healthy aorta, and therefore the, the risk of a paraplegia probably will increase. But on the other hand, you have a really dedicated, perfect stand graft, and when that fits in, you will save a lot of time and you don't have the problems with regulatory and legal issues, and you can be sure that if the planning is proper, that it will fit into. So for the modification, what we use, we use the Cook Genit TX2 stand graft. I think uh, the stand graft has a lot of advantages. First of all, it has a very good, um, um, it is, it's, it's a very easily to modify stand graft. Um, the fabric is of excellent quality and can be modified without any problems. Also, the resheating process is very easy to do. And due to the fixation with the, uh, the, the top fixation with uh, uh, three different nitinol wires, you can um, use one of these nitinol wires to um, create a diameter reducing wire. And as it's a, a tube stand graft, it's uh, in a lot of terms, uh, mo it can be modified. And uh, the uh, extension uh, downwards, the distally, we usually do, do with a, a gore excluder prosthesis as it doesn't have any kind of super renal fixations and we are very flexible in terms of the height where we can put in the stand graft uh, for overlapping uh, with the TX2 prosthesis. But there are also um, other stand grafts that can be used for modifications. Uh, a lot of people nowadays use the Cooksinit Alpha Thoracic stand graft because one of the advantages, so this is something you will see afterwards, is that the stands are a little bit wider and therefore the modifications in the fabric uh, can be done more easily because you have more space to do them. But you also can use the cooked zenit abdominal stand graft um, if you don't want to uh, um, add on a um, separate extension bifurcation graft. And that's also true for the Metronic Valiant thoracic stand graft. This is something that is um, used um, for this is something that is used especially by Ludovic Cano for modifications of stand grafts in terms of fenestrated stand grafts for the aortic arch. And also the Medtronic Endurant stand graft is something that has or was already modified and can be used for that. Important is that you have a stand graft with a sheet and that can be deployed and resheeted again. Therefore, with, uh, um, with a rigorous stand graft that don't have a sheet, it just has a PTV membrane around the stand graft. If you open up the membrane of the stand graft, the stand is fully deployed and you have no possibility to reseat it as far as I know. So uh, when it comes to the modification, you usually do that uh, 
uh, as a back table modification during the anesthesia uh, induction. Here you can see a picture where I'm doing this kind of modification with the resident of my team. And um, usually it depends on uh, how many fenestrations and uh, how ex extensive the modifications are, but it takes about uh, 30 to 45 minutes um, to do these modifications and to have um, the stand graft in time. So you see this is nothing you can use in an instable ruptured patient. This is something you usually should use in, in, in a stable situation of ruptured or symptomatic um, aneurysms. And, this was one of the cases where we had the time and during our modification, the anesthesia did the introduction. The modifications you can do is, so on the one hand, you can do the fenestrations. That's just that you just uh, cut in a hole into your fabric and um, enforce it with a suture line. But on the other hand, you can also uh, create branches um, or short cuffs. Branches is uh, if you have a big aneurysms, um, where you, where you don't um, have and, and where you don't have the wall contact of, of your stand craft or your fenestrations to the aortic wall, and for these uh, branches, usually um, I use um, uh, wire bands, and the wire bands you you cut them and uh, suture them uh, into holes uh, that are. I cut it into the fabric of the stand grafts. And these little cuffs um, I usually use uh, when it comes uh, to stand grafts that has a very short but, uh, but recognizable distance between the stand graft and the aortic wall. That is too short the distance uh, for branches, but it's too long. Um, but it's too long for fenestrations so that the fenestrations won't have a wall contact. Then you can use this short cuffs and these um, increase uh, your, your security in terms of sealing of your bridging stand graft to the aortic process. And when you do these modifications, um, first of all, you have um, the locations of the fenestrations or the, or, or the fenestrations for the branches have to be marked on the fabric. And I'm going to show you how I do that in a short video afterwards. And uh, then you create these fenestrations by using a fabric uh, cauterizer. As you can see here on, on the bottom left, uh, at picture 1A. And uh, usually you s it's, it's like uh, your custom made devices from company. Uh, fenestration size for renal arteries should be six by six millimeters. And for celiac uh, trunk or for the SMA, it should be about eight by eight millimeters. And um, what I do then is that uh, each fenestration is going to be reinforced by a snare loop. And uh, the suture line is an interlocking suture line with uh, 5-0 anti-bond or a gore suture line. And the same is for the branches or for the for the for the small cuffs is that you suture this um, short wire band segments with your anti-bond or gore suture in, inter, in an interlocking way and with a snare loop um, to the fabric of your main or stand craft. So um, sometimes um, it's um, critical to place your um, fenestrations because um, the struts will be within the fenestrations. And when you have the struts within the fenestrations, you will have uh, a problem with the deployment of the bridging stand craft. And uh, what you can do there is that you should release the sutures um, uh, of the stand graft that is inside uh, your fenestration and then you can relocate your stand by widening the stand in an M fashion or you bend this uh, and therefore you can create a proper um, space um, to do your cauterization and uh, the creation of the fenestration and the reinforcement then. So here we, you will see uh, the first video, short video about the physician modified physician modification. First, you deploy the stand graft. Afterwards, you make a center line and bring on from the center line in terms of distances from the top and uh, in terms of uh, on a vertical and on a horizontal plane. Uh, for in the terms of orientation of the fenestration, you make your markings, and uh, if you have all of your markings. And you uh, take your 
cauterizer and um, can uh, cauterize then um, the fabric. You have to avoid uh, a real um, burning of, of the fabric. Therefore, you should wetten it before uh, with a saline. And uh, then you just uh, measure uh, the, the diameter of, of, your, of the fenestration. And uh, so this is intended for renal artery. It should be about six, six millimeters. And if it's uh, not uh, wide enough, you just uh, can very, very cautiously, you can widen up uh, your fenestration with the counter. Then I cut here the loop of a snare. And this can be used for, for um, multiple fenestrations. You don't, and you just bring on here um, the snare to the edge of the fenestration and suture the snare loop with your interlocking in this uh, a picture with interlocking etibond uh, sutures to the fabric of your stand craft. So and you do that for all of your fenestration or scallops and uh, uh, when you finish with that uh, you usually should do a diameter diameter reducing uh, first of all I would say technique so the, the diameter reducing wire uh, facilitates the implantation because it allows you space for catheter manipulation and movement. And uh, what you can do with the TX2 prosthesis, for example, that you retrieve the nitinol wire from the inner cannula and uh, the inner cannula you can open up with a scalpel. And uh, one of these uh, three nitinol wires is then retrieved and rerouted through and through the fabric of the stand graft using a needle. And then you constrain uh, your stand grafts using loops of proline. And the first loop is stitched around the fabric and stand strut and then placed around the nitinol wire. You can see that in, in, in here in picture D. And the second loop is stitched into the fabric and stand and then rooted around the first proline loop. So you can see that especially here in F and in the magnification here. And with that, you can, if you do that for every stand row, you will get a diameter reducing, and therefore you really can maneuver your stand graft uh, in in the aorta and replace it for a better cannulation of um, of uh, your intended target vessel. But do not place the suture through the first proline loop because what happens then is that it will interlock and it won't open up. So, but if you're in a, in a hurry or if you don't use uh, the cook prosthesis, there's another technique, I call it the fast technique because it's really much more faster than with the rerouting of the nitinol wire. You do just some proline 5.0 sutures at six o'clock. And um, after you do, did your cannulation of the target vessels with your sheets, you can just rupture your sutures with, with for example, a reliant balloon. The disadvantage here is you have less control and you have to use more force um, to open up uh, your, your craft, but it works. So here you will see a short video how um, I prepare this diameter reducing wire. First of all, I open up the inner cannula with a scalpel. Here with a knife, I open it up, and uh, then um, with a needle of a suture, I um, here you can see the needle. I retrieve one of the three um, nitinol wires that uh, goes um, that go to the top, and uh, and uh, you don't you shouldn't uh, grab uh, the nitinol wire with a forceps because it can break. So you please use use for that. Uh, um, a needle of, of a suture and here you have your wire. Then as next uh, step you use your um, needle and uh, bring it through and through the fabric of the stand graft and reroute um, your nitinol wire through this needle. And uh, then uh, for better distance control I use the uh, pusher or dilatator of a sheet and do my uh, suture lines. And the first uh, suture line should be around the nitinol wire and the second suture line should be around the first suture line. Please don't interlock it. Okay, and that this is something you have to do for every row. So um, 
what you also can do if in for for um, a branches is you can preload guide wires and uh, usually should use uh, 014 or 018 inch um, guide wires you introduce them via the fenestration or branch uh, and uh, then you uh, bring them into the distal shaft of the standcraft uh, cannula and um, then you come with a 110 centimeter through and through sheet from the brachial access to the femoral artery and then the guide wires can be accessed uh, sequentially uh, for each um, fenestration or branch. So this is something I've never used because this is something that takes additional time and uh, usually um, um, I'm secure enough to get the, the, the cannulations done in time. So the resheating process you can use for example 1-0 silk sutures to collapse the stents and then uh, remove as the device is resheated and if the modification include more than one branch you also can load the physician modified stand graft into a 24 French sheet using a peel away sheet so this is also I've never used because usually even with with uh, um, a branches uh, you can bring in uh, your stand graft into your sheet you shouldn't use um, a stand graft at the end of a, a French size sheet so the next stand graft size would go with a bigger sheet. Probably you should think about using the next stand graft size. So here's the um, video of the resheating process. Um, I don't use the silk uh, sutures. What I use is uh, a tourniquet. I think um, Swenson's. It's 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 a little bit easier for that. So um, first of all, we we use the loop and uh, wrap the loop around uh, the stands, and we bring uh, down the the, the uh, Swenson and uh, can uh, compress uh, the stents. It can be easily uh, fixed with with, with a uh, mosquito clamp here, and um, you, you can do that with all stand rows, or you just do it with the first two ones, and after that you just wetten it up with saline, and you. Um, advance your sheet to the stand grafts just have to be sure that all stand struts are inside the sheet and if you have well, the first few millimeters of the stands inside the sheet you can open up your your um, tourniquet with advancing further on the sheet here you see and then you get you go stepwise to the top resheat it and the resheating process you open up uh, the tourniquets for, for the stand that is resheated and in the end it should look like this. So the implantation process is it's just the same. I don't lose too many words about that. It's, it's, it's just the same as in every other fenestrated graft uh, with your with your C armor and your angus suite you bring in you bring in uh, your modified stand graft you, you deploy it um, you just cannulate all of your fenestration uh, and uh, deploy it then completely and uh, here you see the first patient I showed you uh, where we put in uh, here you, it, this was a bare metal stand because the um, because the uh, scallop didn't open up um, um, as we imagined, so we put in a bare metal. But uh, here, this was a TX2 modified stand graft with uh, uh, with um, distal uh, bi iliac um, gore stand graft with two fenestrations and everything. This so was direct postoperatively, on, I think, on the first postoperative day in a symptomatic aneurysm, and everything went fine. So nowadays there are a lot of um, publications about the uh, physician modified stand craft experience and it's really a secure and um, good technique. You just have to be um, have to have some experience with planning of, of the stand crafts. You have to have some experience with implantation of the custom made stand crafts. And if you have done a, a couple of them, I think you can do the next step to do your physician modified 
cases. So in conclusions, I think that uh, physician modified stent grafts represent an excellent option for complex abdominal aortic aneurysms in emergency when not suitable for open repair of, of the shelf devices. A combination of these um, uh, of uh, branches and fenestration allows treatment for almost all acute thoracoabdominal or even abdominal pathologies. And however, a high degree of experience in planning and Im implantation of um, custom-made devices and aortic aneurysms are required. So thank you for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Over to you for Q&A. Yes, so um, sh short video, we're a little bit over time, but uh, there were some questions I, I just wanted to, to answer um, before we close the sessions today. One question was, if we really use this uh, physician modified stand grafts in emergency setting with ruptures, yes, we do. Um, so not only in my personal experience, there are also publications that, that, that see or that uh, state that if a patient comes into the hospital with a rupture, the, the, the time delay until death in untreated patients is not within minutes, it's within hours. And that's what I see sometimes. It's, it really takes time until the, the whole workup uh, and operating room is available, the anesthesia did the introduction. So this is also the time you can use for preparing uh, to do or do the preparations of your physician modified stand grafts. And, and so therefore, the, the patients have to be stable. That's that's the one condition. In unstable uh, uh, patients, I wouldn't do that. But in stable, in, in stable ruptures, we do that, yes. So um, another question was if we had, had any alignments. No, I never had one. And uh, to my personal experience, I really think that, and that's interesting, that uh, physician modified stand grafts are probably a little bit more forgiving than uh, custom made devices. I don't know why. Um, and um, this is my experience. They're really forgiving. And, and also in, in terms of uh, cannulating your fenestrations or your branches, uh, it's really easy with, with this snare loops uh, sutured around uh, the, the fenestrations. Uh, you have a, a real high visibility and also a three-dimensional impression um, under fluoroscopy. And therefore, um, um, I never had a misalignment. So once you, you saw that the, the, the scallop didn't, go up wide enough so we, for security reasons, so even we had a, a, a good um, perfusion of the SMA, we did in a, a bare metal stand to open it up a little bit more. So um, yes, um, these were, were the questions. I think um, experience is, is a big, big topic in that, um, but um, in, in emergency situations, I'm not a big fan of, 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 um, of chimney grafts, uh, to, to, uh, to be honest. I think the, the results are not so good that you should do that probably. Uh, and the, the publications on that topic are a little bit um, uh, controversy, but we will hear about that more on day three. So really looking forward to that. And um, uh, oh, last question here, I see bench preparation. Well, it, it really depends on, on how much uh, um, how much uh, modifications you have to do, but usually it takes about, uh, with one fenestration, it's done in 20 minutes, with two fenestration it takes about 30 minutes, and in really complex with, with branches and so on, it can take up to one hour, 120, I would say. So um, now it's my pleasure to conclude the day for, for, for this first session. Tomorrow it, uh, at five Central European time, uh, we will have our second session. Uh, there we will deal with um, open surgical treatment, very interesting faculty, very interesting presentation. And the same is the same like today. So thank you very much for this great faculty. Thank you very much for, for, for the chairman. Um, thank you very much for this uh, great questions and for the participation of, of, of the attendees. I think this is something um, um, these, um, this, this uh, webinar, this workshop uh, lives from. And yeah, I, I, I hope uh, we will see you all tomorrow at, at five Central European time, probably some more. So we still have, we have a big license for, for this webinar. So we have still a place for registrations. And um, I wish you a good evening or wherever you are on the world. Good morning. And we will see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Great Bye. presentation. <laughs>